Okay, now we have the last module of the AI First uh, Engineering Unit on Deep Learning for Health and Medicine. And um, this is a sort of my view, overview of where areas of further study of COVID and pandemics as, and pandemics, and I point out a way of looking at everything as complex systems that maybe allows a, a thorough more thorough view of, the, of what to do. Okay. So these were the um, areas we identified. Understanding how COVID interacts with tissues. So you have to model cells, you model tissues, you model viruses, and you model at the cell and virus interactions. You have to understand how the disease is spread by contact, which is actually the same technology used the so-called model critical infrastructure, so-called socio-technical simulations. And in this, and in a lot of these simulations, that the basis of it is a model for how the world works, who moves where when, whether you, who is a person, a car, a, an atomic bomb, or a aircraft. Then we have diagnostics, which is the whole area of the new devices, wearables, Fitbits, not Fitbits, Apple Watches. Then we have diagnostic software, remember this digital therapeutics. Then we have the study of time series, because a lot of this uh, wearables are going to give you data as a function of time, and then you have to take the data as a function of time, which is streaming data, and understand how to analyze it. So there's lots of good computing research there. Then we have to look at some of the things we did in the last lesson, understand possible drugs. Originally, this was called um, chem informatics. Now it's been done by uh, computer studies, and also we can do real tests. Uh, and the chem informatics is becoming these deep learning networks. Previously, when I used to work on it, um, maybe 10 years ago, it was not, they did, deep learning didn't exist, and the field was a little bit of a struggle. Then we have the whole medical infrastructure and the whole medical system, and there we have telehealth as a prominent uh, new development. So these are just cosmic areas that you could think about further studying. Let's sort of think about this um, concept of pandemics or complex systems and what that means. So complex systems were um, a very old idea. I mean, I certainly came in touch with them when I was at Caltech, which must have been uh, um, the 1980s. And um, they are, they, there was a famous place called the Santa Fe Institute, which was sort of a spin-off of uh, Los Alamos National Lab, uh, which Los Alamos is pretty near uh, Santa Fe. The town of Santa Fe is the biggest town next to, next to Los Alamos. And they have, uh, it's a very distinguished group of people there. So the idea is that what does physics do? Physics studies systems. And the systems of quarks or systems of galaxies. Now those are complicated, but they're not tend to be called complex systems because you know what the laws are. You have quantum chromodynamics and its extensions. You have Newton's laws and its Einstein's extensions. Um, if you look at pandemics, well, pandemics, uh, you need the dynamics of people and viruses. Well, people and viruses do not obey Newton's law. They're made out of atoms and molecules that obey Newton's law, but not they themselves, or Dirac's equation, but they, or Schrodinger's equation, but they don't, they're not themselves. The, you, the fundamental unit of, this, of the model on simulation is, does not obey known equations. So that, but they are a system. The set of all viruses or the set of all people getting infected are systems. Uh, the set of all doctors and uh, treating them as a system. So these are systems, but they're systems of macroscopic ent entities. I mean, macroscopic, the bigger, the reason why they don't obey Newton's laws is they're bigger systems with complexity built into them, which means they have their own way of uh, moving around. And so complex systems are things, uh, collections of macroscopic objects, they tend to be thought of, you can think of them as graphs because they're connected. 
um, and it's well known, you know, you can have connections out by Twitter or connections by Facebook. And they have a, and then the connections, in the case of physics, the connections are due to forces and Newton's laws and things like that. In the case of complex systems, the connections are due to people bumping into each other in social non-distancing or uh, less, um, in terms of getting the virus, a less dangerous connection of our Facebook and so on. Okay, so we want to understand how to do complex systems. And so this is a pretty interesting area, which you'll find many people studying. And both deep learning and models are useful. And the same is true here. We're going to look at pandemics as a complex system. And we can use deep learning and we can use physics-like models. And physics-like models tend to replace the particle. In the case of uh, molecular dynamics, you have particles, the atoms, and they have forces, uh, Leonard Jones, and they interact. Well, physics-like models have agents, such as cells or cell components, and those uh, agents interact. And they have laws which tell one agent, an agent what to do when it interacts with another agent, or when some event occurs, like a virus sticks its nose into you. Um, but deep learning for complex systems is like the work that we did in the transportation system lectures, where DD, Uber, and USC uh, looked at the, uh, the set of riders, 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 rides, and drivers as a complex and system superimposed on another complex system, the transportation network of roads, and et cetera. And they use deep learning to see how to evolve it. So deep learning is very relevant for complex systems. And that's, that's what it says. Transportation is a complex system. In the past, it's no longer quite so popular. The best known example were war games. The Department of Defense of the U.S. had a famous effort called studying war games. And it actually generated a lot of the early technology. Um, including what's called event-driven simulations. Event-driven simulations are very uh, important because the model you have for agents interacting is often an event model. Uh, here you have a cell sitting here doing nothing. When a virus hits it, that's an event. And there has to be rules to know what to do. The same in the case of war games, you have your tank. When an anti-tank mortar fires a shot which hits the tank, then that tank has to react. It has rules to know what it knows what to do when it's hit by a shell. So event-driven simulations are simulations which are not, which are driven not by equations, but by events. And they're perfectly well defined. You can actually do them quite straightforwardly, except for one trouble. It's pretty difficult to run them in parallel. When I'm simulating molecular dynamics by forces, the different particles sitting around at a given time can be moved up simultaneously on different components of a parallel system. However, if I have a bunch of agents sitting around driven by events, well, it's not so trivial because uh, let's say um, agent number one is is a tank, and it is it and it is I don't know it launches a missile. And agent number two is a, is a ballistic missile launcher, which also launches a missile. Well, the problem is, so what time? What is timing? Supposing they're actually interacting with each other, then the one that fires first actually will win, presumably, well, if it was accurate. But you may not know who fires first, because they're just sitting there with times. They don't know about the rest of the world. What they will learn is they'll learn about the events when they arrive. And the trouble is the events are not, you don't know when they're going to arrive. So there's a terrible problem with time synchronization in event-driven simulations. And there's all sorts of amazing technology like time warp or optimistic simulation. <coughs> Which way, <coughs> ways of doing this. Um, and the trouble is, all those methods just are really complex. They take something which for molecular classic simulations is real simple, running things in parallel and makes it real hard. 
However, in epidemiology, people have actually managed to do some uh, suitable approximations and diligent uh, deep analysis, which allows them to avoid this problem. So you can have a bunch of agents, but these agents can effectively be evolved in time because they they get they all move at a given time. That's different from the classical warm gaming problem, which I, which I should say war games has a famous software system called HLA, which is a variant of CORVA uh, to define the, war, the entities in war games as objects. And that was hopefully a total failure. Who was there? Anyway, but well, well, it didn't actually move on and generate a lot of new work. And now it's all replaced by service-oriented architectures. Because agents are basically services. Services accept messages and do things. Well, that's exactly what agents do. Um, OK, let's, let's, so that's a really interesting area which you could even study a little in this as part of COVID, because it's relevant to COVID. Uh, all right, here's deep learning. And uh, we've explained before why deep learning is relevant. Agents don't have equations. What they do have is hidden variables. And um, I, I, there's an early example I gave, but I didn't actually expand on, on earthquakes. Earthquakes are actually governed by the laws of physics. But unfortunately, they're hidden variables, like the friction forces and the exact way the faults are touching or not touching each other. And you can't find that out except from ancillary data, which is actually the shocks that are observed before earthquakes. So earthquakes are full of hidden variables. And you can apply deep learning to earthquakes to learn those hidden variables. But you can also apply deep learning to right hailing and to, and to the evolution of the um, spread of the COVID virus, because again, there are secret hidden variables, which may, or may, which may, I mean, those variables might be decisions made by, by politicians as well as uh, things which are governed by Newton's laws, as they were in earthquakes. Because it doesn't really matter whether the uncertainty is the whims of a politician or the unknown friction force between um, faults. In both cases, there is a deterministic mechanism. Telling you, telling us how things are going to happen, but you don't have enough information to actually think of it from that point of view. So you have to learn that what's going on from the observed data, and that's precisely what deep learning does with this incredible training idea. It's a revolution. The concept of building a complex model and training on data was what we always wanted to do, but somehow we didn't get. We didn't realize that deep learning had already done it for us. So it was stupid. Anyway, complex systems are not random. In fact, if they were random, you would be find it pretty hard to study. They, they have randomness, but they're not random. They have um, real, there are variables. Because variables which have random results are actually serious, because they provide structure. And we can. Deep learning uses the observations to build a model of a complex system that can project to the future. And you can actually combine deep learning with modeling. You can train deep learning on a model and then customize on a, on a particular piece of observations. That is how you can actually do a good job on um, uh, personalization. So anyway, here we have a lot of data and um, there's also a lot more on the COVID, and that can be used to train deep learning networks. And if you look, look at the um, pronouncements in the press, they vary all over the place. Actually, they're getting a little more sensible, in my opinion. I think you could, you, they could have been made more sensible a long time ago. The trouble is, it doesn't really matter whether you have a great model. Unless people believe it, it doesn't matter. It's not going to get used. So there is a sort of issue of credibility, and you have to be important enough for your model to be used. OK, so here we have modeling, which is, uh, um, I actually learned to model with Richard Feynman, a famous Nobel Prize winner at Caltech. And he was very keen on models, because he understood physics intuitively. He built a little model. That's how he found out about uh, Quarks from uh, experimental data from scattering of uh, 
scattering at a linear accelerator, electron proton scattering. And he, his, he, he was able to build models. Models are things which have physics. They are the things they are built as though they were physics, but they use phenomenological or approximate formulas for the uh, interaction. And so there are probably no precise equations. They're just, um, depends on the model exactly how precise it is. And you can model the spread of disease inside the human body. They say, um, it's not, you can do, we can't really do molecular dynamics because a virus has 10 to the 14 atoms in it. Here's a really nice article telling you everything you want to know about viruses. So viruses have 10 to the 8, cells have 10 to the 14, but 10 to the 8 is already too big. Um, so if we now look at, say, a virtual tissue, which is a collection of cells, maybe millions of cells, that's a complex system. And you study it as a bunch of agents which uh, capture the behavior of, co of collections of atoms, so the agents of the viruses and the cells. And this uh, whole complex system is impacted by how what people are doing, because policy decisions will change what's going on. And um, these tissue models will give a better idea of how the drugs work, and therefore allow you to predict better which are the right drugs. You can also look at computation epidemiology as a complex system, the agents of the interacting people, and the interaction rules are governed by how they move around and what uh, social distancing uh, restrictions there are. Okay, <clears throat> so we can actually interact with deep learning and pandemics, as I've already mentioned. You can train on the, on the model but customize, say, to a particular city or state with the data, because the overall structure of the deep learning hidden variables is in the model, it's probably correct. The model is probably not correct, though, in the details of the observations. And those observations can be fed in as further training data to customize the deep learning model. And then you can also build a giant complex systems of everything in the world. Uh, the chemicals, the viruses, the people, the policy maker, the beds and the ventilators and the detection devices. All of these form a giant, giant, huge giant, let's say we a giant, giant, a giant complex system. And if we look at futures for this whole of thing, we can have, think of everything as a complex system. We can do physics-only models and deep learning-only models. But I think to do well, we're going to have to mix them up in a very rich fashion, because we can not only use deep learning to improve a model coming, I mean, a prediction coming from a model, we can actually use deep learning to speed up a model, because we can take deep learning and make it learn a virus. And instead of having to simulate a virus in detail, you simulate a deep learning so-called surrogate for the virus. And then we have to join all these complex mixtures of deep learning and physics together. And that, I think, is an incredible challenge for the next few years. And there's algorithms and computer systems issues. We need new software. Um, and then somehow this is the future of engineering. Engineering studies macroscopic objects. It doesn't study microscopic objects. You don't do cosmology and engineering. You do cosmology and physics, and computational epidemiology is much nearer engineering. So AI first, or what you can also call model-based engineering, is precisely this vision of the DL and modeling integration in a complex system. So that's the exciting future. Let's get going on it. Thank you.